Open your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want to read just uh, the last part of verse 11. There the Apostle tells us, For we are not ignorant of His devices. I hope to begin this evening a study titled Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. If that rings a bell with you, I'm glad. It was meant to. The title is borrowed from Thomas Brooks, who wrote on the subject more than 300 years ago. Much of what I say will come directly from his book. Some of it will be my own thinking, and I hope all of it will be agreeable to the Holy Scripture and the leading of God's Spirit. I'm not going to say repeatedly, quote, unquote, Brooks said, the Puritan wrote, Thomas said, and so forth. And so if you want to untangle his thinking from mine, well, get the book and follow along. Now, Brooks was a Puritan, and like many other Puritans, he specialized in cases of conscience. He worked hard to think through the devices of Satan to see how the devil would uh, uh, ply us with his temptations and lead the believing soul into sin. That was the specialty of the Puritans, and it seems to me no one has matched them in the subsequent years. And so I hope tonight that this will be a blessing to you. In the weeks to come, we'll, we'll continue looking at the topic that he introduces in his book, and that is explained to us at length in the Scripture. Uh, Thomas Brooks died in 1680. And I pray by the Spirit of God that he being dead will yet speak to your soul and mine. The text is fairly easy to understand. Paul tells us wherever God is at work, Satan is also active to undo the good that God does. Some of his dirty work is right out in the open, as when Paul was stoned at Lystra or beheaded in Rome. But not all of Satan's work is so obvious. In addition to frontal attacks, he also uses sneak attacks, attacks on the rear. Paul in this passage calls these sneak attacks devices. We might call them tricks or cunning strategies. One of them we'll mention tonight, others in the weeks to come, if the Lord permits. And so the question I want to present to you tonight is, or really two questions. First, how does Satan tempt us? And then what do we do about these temptations? Brooks calls these Satan's devices, and then he offers remedies to escape them. The first device that Brooks mentions in his book is this one. Satan presents the bait and hides the hook. In order to lead the soul astray into sin, what uh, Satan does is he takes a hook, that's the sin, the consequence of our sin, and he hides the hook under a delectable looking bait. Like a good salesman, Satan puts the best face on his product. He emphasizes the pleasure and the profit that sin may bring while ignoring the wrath and misery that must follow. Examples of this device are commonly found in the Bible, only a few of which I'll now mention. His first temptation was just that. God permitted Adam and Eve to eat from any tree they wanted, any tree but one. For in the day they ate from that tree, they would surely die. That was the divine warning. But when the devil comes to Eve, he makes no mention at all of the death that must follow her disobedience. Instead, he pushes the beauty of the fruit, its delectable taste, 
and the divine wisdom that is sure to come if only she'll eat it. And so, the narrator of this story tells us that Eve looked at the fruit and it was a beautiful fruit. And she saw that it was good for food and that she and her husband would be as God Himself if only they'd eat it. On her, the sales job worked to perfection. The woman was deceived, said the Apostle, and she and her husband fell as a result of this temptation. You see what he did here. He doesn't mention the death. He doesn't mention the alienation. He doesn't mention the nakedness. He doesn't mention being driven out of the garden. He doesn't mention the curse. He doesn't mention the thorns and thistles. He doesn't mention the multiplied sorrows and birth. He doesn't mention returning to the dirt. He doesn't mention any of these things, though all of them were true about the sin. But all he does is he mentions how lovely the fruit is, how tasty it surely is, and how much wisdom must come from eating it. Satan, you see, has baited the hook and concealed the hook quite cleverly. A second example is given to us from the book of Proverbs. And that's the example of the, well, what the Bible calls the strange woman or, or the harlot, we might say. She entices a young man with these fetching words. I have spread my bed with tapestry. I have perfumed my bed. Let us take our fill of love. My husband is not at home. And on and on she goes. Everything she said, I assume, is true. But she left some things out. She didn't mention that if he followed her advice, he'd be an ox going to the slaughter. That he'd be a fool going to the stocks. Or he'd be a bird going to the snare. She didn't mention the arrow that would strike his liver. She ignored the strong men who were wounded by her and the fact that her house, uh, what is the way to hell, descending into the chambers of death. Oh, she told the truth all right. Everything she said was true, but she only told half a truth. And the half truth told as the whole truth becomes an untruth. Satan is not only a master at liar, but he's also a master at telling just enough truth to make the temptation seem plausible. Again, the hook is death, but the bait are the, are the fetching words of the harlot. A third example comes from drinking. Good wine, the writer of the Proverbs says, is red, sparkling, and smooth. Now that sounds like a modern commercial, doesn't it? All good selling points. But the buyer doesn't notice the other things that come with it. Things like woe, sorrow, contentions, complaints, wounds without cause, redness of eyes, and many more. These are not the byproducts or the results that are advertised. In each case, the hook is wrath and misery, but the devil's bait carefully concealed it. And so this is Satan's device. He makes the temptation look very lovely to us. And he may even tell the truth about it, at least part of the truth. But he doesn't tell the whole truth. He emphasizes the pleasure of sin, the profit of sin, the probability of getting away with sin. Nobody will see you. Nobody will catch you. Ah, it won't hurt anything if you just do it once or twice. But he doesn't mention the barbed hook that's inside that bait. The sin and the misery the bad conscience, and who knows, maybe the eternal consequences which must follow that sin. Well, how do we avoid the lures of Satan? Thomas Brooks offers four remedies. The first of which is this. Keep the greatest distance from sin and from playing with the golden bait that Satan holds forth to catch you. Romans 12 verse 9 says, Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. This word abhor is a very, very strong one. 
It means to find something revolting. It means to hate it with a horror and to recoil from it. That's what Paul says. He said, I don't want you admiring sinful things or even thinking about them. He says, I want you to recoil from them as horrid things, things like, well, like a plague things like some uncleanness, things like leprosy. Recoil from these things. Don't come near them. This means, if you know something tempts you, and of course our temptations differ from person to person, but if you know something tempts you, stay as far away from it as possible. J. Adams once counseled a young man who was drawn into, well, let's just say, unwholesome entertainment. He prayed hard against his lust, but he said, every day when I pass the theater, well, something just pulls me into it. You know what Adam said? He said, don't go down that street anymore. What's a few extra yards compared to the loss of your soul? You see, the young man would not go into the adult theater if he went down another street. And so this means that you have to identify your temptation and do everything you can to stay away from it. To stay away from it mentally and if possible to stay away from it physically. And so if you're tempted to rent unedifying films, why don't you just cut up your blockbuster video card? You can get to heaven without it. If you're tempted to buy things you can't afford, Throw away the catalogs that come in the mail. If you consistently watch too much TV, sell it, give to the poor, follow the Lord Jesus and you'll have treasure in heaven. We tempt God when we pray, lead us not into temptation while walking right into it. The contrast between what really two good men could not be greater. There are two men in the Bible who were tempted with the sin of adultery. Both were good men. Both were were men of prayer and, and men who did much for God. One was Joseph and the other was David. What did Joseph do when tempted by Potiphar's wife? Well, he dived out the window to get away from her. That's what he did. But what did David do when he was tempted by Uriah's wife? Well, he looked a while and a while longer and a while longer still. By running out of the house, Joseph escaped a very grave temptation. But David, by looking and looking and looking some more, found the words of James confirmed in his life. Lust, when it's conceived, brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And so, identify your temptation, and to quote the proverb, avoid it, do not travel on it, turn away from it, and pass on. It'll do your soul good. Stay away from things that tempt you. I counseled a woman some years ago who had a real shopping problem, I mean overspending problem. But it was no wonder. Her favorite recreational activity was to go to the mall. I said, stay away from the mall. That's an easy one. Toss the catalogs. You can live fine without these things. So this is not true in every case, but it's true in some cases. Identify your sin and do everything you can to stay away from it. Keep a very great distance between yourself and your temptation. That's Brooks' first advice, but not just Brooks. That's God's counsel. The second thing Brooks said is, consider that sin is but a bitter sweet. He quotes Job chapter 20, verses 12 to 14. Though evil is sweet in his mouth, yet his stomach turns sour, it becomes cobra venom in him. Let's face it. Sin provides some pleasure. The trouble is, the pleasure is both mixed and momentary. Mixed in that, with it, there is a sense of guilt and a grieving of God's Spirit. Do you, do you enjoy your sins? Well, sort of, but not quite. There's something in the back of your mind gnawing away at you. The sin has not satisfied you. 
it has in fact left you less content than you were before you gave into it. And the hollow pleasure that sin brings is also temporary. It doesn't last long and must result in the opposite of what it promised. The young man in Proverbs thought a quick liaison would feel good, but it didn't. His flesh and body were in fact consumed by the affair. Think about the true nature of sin. Whether anyone catches you or not, the sweetest sin is partly bitter at the time and finally very, very bitter. Thirdly, consider that sin will usher in the greatest and saddest losses upon our soul. The key word here is losses. When we think of the punishment of sin, we usually think of um, what will happen to us. Somebody will catch us. Somebody will think ill of us. We might lose our job for doing that. My wife might leave me for doing that. Something like that. We usually think of the bad things that will happen to us. Things will, of course, happen. Bad things indeed. We often forget, though, what will not happen to us. The good things we lose through sin. Well, what are they? Well, what do we lose through sin? We must lose something. Of course we do. What do we lose through sin? Well, how about fellowship with God? When we sin willfully and without repentance, we lose the communion with God that we once enjoyed. In the first chapter of 1 John, the Apostle writes, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ God's Son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Is this fellowship worth having? Well, I think it is, isn't it? This fellowship is worth having. Psalm 16 says that in God's presence is the fullness of joy and at His right hand are pleasures forevermore. This fellowship is worth having. If you've ever lost it, you know how valuable it is. If you've ever gotten a bad conscience and kept it for a while, you'll know that's about the most unpleasant place a believer can be. You know how precious this fellowship is, but it's lost when you willfully sin and don't repent. Well, did something happen to you? Well, no. A lightning bolt didn't strike you. The ground didn't open up and swallow you. Nobody said, aha, I got you. Nothing like that. But what an enormous loss it is to lose the close fellowship you might otherwise have with God. How about the things that go with that fellowship? What things go with fellowship with God? Well, joy is one of those things that go with fellowship with God. John said, I write these things to you that your joy may be full. This is something we have when walking with God in a good conscience. But it's also something we can lose. We can lose the joy that we once had. Paul pleaded with the Galatians, where is that former blessedness? You once had it when you were following Christ alone. But when you got in fellowship with the legalists, you lost the blessedness you once had. And how about David? Psalm 51, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. This is something we lose when we willfully sin and don't repent of it. A very great loss indeed. And then what about peace? Is peace worth having? Peace is something that's worth having, isn't it? The peace of God keeps your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. But that's not when you're meditating on sinful things. It's not when you're uh, leaving known duties undone. It's not when you're hurting those for whom Christ died. It's not, in short, when you're living in a sinful way. We lose this peace. And it's replaced by 
it's replaced by, well, everything that is opposite of peace. It's replaced by aggravation. It's replaced by frustration. It's, it's replaced by a sense of guilt. It's replaced by uh, an alienation. These things take the place of the peace that we might have if only we kept a good conscience. And then how about a good conscience? Is that worth having? Well, I can tell you that a good conscience is very much worth having. A good example? Is that worth setting? Yet when we go into sin and don't repent, we set a bad example and we lead others astray. How about freedom in prayer? I don't know about you, but when I, my heart is hardened, I don't pray very well, do you? Psalm 32 says, When I kept silent, when I kept silent, not praying, my bones waxed old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Oh, we might say words, but we're not praying. We're not praying in any meaningful way. Oh, what a blessing freedom in prayer is. But it's a blessing that is forfeited when we lose fellowship with God in sin. How about the enjoyment of God's Word? Is that a blessing that's worth having? You know, one can read the Word every day, but, well, you know, reading the Word is not everything. How about enjoying that Word? Sometimes you can read the Word like you read the newspaper. Get nothing out of it at all. Get no fellowship out of it, no joy, no peace, no love, no gratitude, no anything. When we fall into sin, we lose the enjoyment of God's Word. Well, these things and many others are worth having, but sin forfeits them till we repent of it. Naomi, who is who really uh, set the example at this point, uh, understood when she said, I went down full, but the Almighty has brought me back empty. And so, when Satan baits the hook and says to you, emphasizes the pleasure of sin, the profit of sin, the probability of not being caught, you remember that sin always leads to great losses, the forfeiting of wonderful blessings, blessings which are more precious than life itself. And then fourthly, consider that sin is very deceitful and bewitching. Is there anything worse than sinning with a bad conscience? Yes, there is. It is sinning with a good conscience. At first, this is hard to do. You know what you're doing is wrong. And for a time, you feel guilty about it. But if you keep on doing it, the guilt becomes less and less noticeable. And soon all the guilt tapers off, but it it doesn't stay there. Then something terrible happens. You begin excusing your sins. And then something worse happens. You begin justifying your sins. And if not restrained by God's Spirit, you end up boasting about your sins. Romans chapter 1 says that they glory in their shame. The things that ought to make them blush are in fact the things they're boasting about and proudest of. How did this come to pass. Did they always feel this way about their sins? Of course they didn't. No, at one time the sin brought pain to their consciences, but they numbed that pain and soon it went away. And soon it started actually feeling quite good. You see, this person has been hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Unless God softens the heart, that must lead to apostasy. And nothing in the world could be worse than that. It would be better for the apostate if he had never been born. And so Satan has his devices. He has his strategies. He has a lot of tricks up his sleeve. 
And we mustn't be ignorant of them. Maybe the most common is the one I've spoken on tonight. He presents the bait and hides the hook. We all know this. We all know that there's an attractive side to sin, but ultimately it's an ugly and hurtful and ruinous thing. We all know this, but how often do we think about it? Oh, we might think about it in church. We might think about it when we see somebody else fall into sin. We might think about it when discussing spiritual issues. But how often do we think about it in our day-to-day lives? How often, when pleasure is presented to us, do we look for the hook that may be inside of it? I pray that God would give us the eyes to look for it, to see it, and to turn away from it as a wise fish would, that delectable looking worm with a hook inside of it. And I pray that God will do these things for you and for me, and that He'll do these things for Christ's sake. Let's pray, please. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are that um, you are the God in, who is wise enough to see through the strategies of Satan and to show us ways of escaping his snare. But Lord, we're not that wise unless you reveal your wisdom to us. And so please reveal that wisdom to us and give us hearts that are eager for wisdom and that will take the wisdom that you do give us. I pray, Lord, that not one person here will be fooled by the baited hook, but I pray instead that we'll turn away from our sins and escape the devil's traps. Thank you, Lord, that we have a Savior who forgives us when we do fail And I pray that this Savior would walk with us and enable us to avoid the temptations of this life. Thank you, Lord, for faithful servants in the past like Thomas Brooks. Thank you for keeping a witness alive in this world, men wiser than we are, who can help us to understand your word. And I pray, Lord, that we might receive the wisdom, however it's communicated to us, and give thanks to you for it. Thank you again, Lord, and I do pray that you would now hear our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.